but essentially personal information captures any information, whether it's name, home phone number, email address, that relates to an identifiable individual. So if there's anything that enables you to identify who the individual is and how that information relates to them, that's personal information. Some provinces have developed carve-outs where business contact information, basically business card information, is not captured. And some have carved out work product information. Meaning, for example, if you're drafting a report, which includes your opinions for your work purposes, that's not your personal information about your opinions, that's the work product information of your employer. This case study relates specifically to the Ottawa Hospital and it's in respect of the Personal Health Information Protection Act of Ontario, which applies to health information custodians. But because all privacy legislation is based on the same 10 privacy principles, the lessons learned from this case study is equally applicable to other organizations more broadly. So the Information Privacy Commissioner of Ontario has issued 10 orders since 2004 when the health privacy legislation was first enacted. And the Ottawa Hospital has been the subject of two of those 10 orders. Each of the orders dealt with a privacy breach that resulted from employees unlawfully accessing, collecting, using, disclosing personal health information on an intentional, wrongful basis. In 2006, the Ottawa Hospital received a privacy complaint. And the complainant claimed that during and after her treatment at the hospital, her personal health information was accessed and some of that personal health information was disclosed without her consent to her estranged husband with whom she was in the midst of divorce proceedings. The hospital investigated the complaint and found that on admission to the hospital, the complainant told staff that she did not want her husband, who was an employee at the hospital, or his girlfriend, who was a nurse at the hospital, to have access to her personal health information shouldn't want them to have any details of her treatment. Following discharge from the hospital, it became very clear to her from her discussions with her estranged husband that he knew of her admittance and the details of her treatment. So she filed her privacy complaint. The hospital investigated the complaint and what they found was that the nurse had accessed the personal health information and had disclosed it to the estranged husband. The hospital took immediate steps to flag her electronic health record and to audit all the accesses to it. They confirmed the privacy breach. But what the hospital did not do was take steps to prevent the nurse from accessing that information any further. And what the nurse did was flagrantly violated not only her professional duties as a registered nurse, but the hospital policy and all the hospital warnings to her specifically and she continued to access that personal information on three further occasions and disclose it to her husband. This is an alarming scenario because it deals not with a mishap or a human error. It deals with intentional wrongful acts of employees. And what's alarming here is the Privacy Commissioner's investigation and order found that the hospital was responsible for this. It wasn't beyond their control. The Privacy Commissioner's investigation found that the hospital failed to take immediate steps to prevent the nurse from getting, getting any further access to this woman's personal health information. And the hospital failed to follow internal policies that it had set up specifically to relate to this kind of an issue. And based on its investigation and conclusions, the Commissioner ordered the hospital to review, revise and revisit its data protection practices and protocols relating to personal health information and also those relating to human resources where discipline of an employee may be warranted. The Privacy Commissioner ordered the hospital to take reasonable and immediate steps upon being notified of a potential privacy breach to contain that breach and make sure there is no further unauthorized access or disclosure of records. And the Privacy Commissioner ordered the hospital to ensure that all employees and agents are aware of their duties under their act and to comply with the hospital's revised data protection policies. So four and a half years later, the Privacy Commissioner had cause to investigate another complaint 
at the Ottawa Hospital. It's clear from Order 10 that the Privacy Commissioner was not impressed with the steps and actions that the hospital took in the intervening period. On the second occasion, a patient complained that her husband's former wife, a diagnostic imaging technologist, inappropriately ask, accessed the personal health records and used and disclosed her personal health records without consent. Again, the hospital conducted an investigation into the complaint and ultimately confirmed the breach. And the audit revealed that the technologist had accessed the complainant's records for over a period of nine months for no health-related purpose. Following the investigation, the hospital assured the complainant that steps had been taken to deal with this breach, but it didn't disclose what steps it took. So the complainant, unsatisfied with the response, went to the Privacy Commissioner's office and complained there. Again, an order was issued. Privacy Commissioner's order sends a strong message to health information custodians, but also more broadly to other custodians of data, whether health information or otherwise, basically saying that they are going to be held accountable for the actions of their employees and agents, even when they are willful and wrongful actions and that developing policies and training employees is just not good enough anymore. You need, need to take further steps to deal with these kinds of scenarios. So in order to be compliant, everyone has to ensure that their privacy policies and practices are current, effective, and followed. They have to ensure that their employees and agents are adequately trained in privacy. They have to respond to complaints or breaches quickly, respectfully, and in accordance with the policies that they establish, and they have to review and audit their privacy policies and practices regularly. So it's this context in which I want to discuss the five good ideas. First idea is that privacy is good for business. So because it's good for business, it really should form part of your corporate culture. And people talk about corporate culture all the time. I had to look it up on Wikipedia to get a definition for you. And what Wikipedia says is that corporate culture describes the psychology, attitudes, experiences, beliefs, values, and norms of an organization. And it's these that control the way individuals within the organization interact with each other and with stakeholders outside of the organization by defining appropriate behavior for various situations. In respect of the Ottawa Hospital orders, the Privacy Commissioner said that this situation speaks broadly to the culture of privacy that must be created in healthcare institutions across the province. Unless policies are interwoven into the fabric of a hospital's day-to-day -day operations, they won't work. Hospitals must ensure that they not only educate their staff about the act and information policies and practices, implemented by the hospital, they also have to ensure that privacy becomes embedded into their institutional culture. So my advice to you is try to embed privacy into your institutional or corporate culture. Think about a variety of societal and organizational campaigns that are out there. And the two easy examples that come to mind are hand hygiene and covering coughs. By raising awareness about these kinds of issues, by publishing posters, by providing ongoing reminders to people to behave in a certain way, you sort of change their behaviors and the way they think about things. And these have been successful campaigns. So to the extent that you can, try to figure out ways to develop a campaign about privacy within your organization. And this is how you start to develop that corporate culture. Privacy is good for business, and therefore you should be reviewing privacy in the context of your governance framework. So this would include considering privacy issues in the context of your strategic and operational objectives, your governance roles and accountabilities, your policy making and decision making, and your relationships with stakeholders. Privacy should be built into all of these. Privacy is good for business, so you should treat it as a business issue and not simply a legal compliance issue. Instead of simply thinking about compliance with the minimal legal requirements that exist for your organization, think about your stakeholders' expectations. So 
So for example, think about the expectations of your funders, your donors, your community served, your members, your volunteers, and others. All of these stakeholders do expect that you treat their personal health information or personal information in accordance with best practices and that you measure up to the privacy standards that have been established by other similar organizations. Privacy is about transparency, accountability, and control. In respect of transparency and accountability, good privacy practices will facilitate the continuation of valuable relationships to your organization. They will serve to preserve existing funders and donors and to attract new ones and they will serve to build confidence and trust in your organization. When one considers the issue of control in the privacy context, one usually thinks about an individual's control over how their personal information is collected, used, and disclosed. I'm gonna flip this around today, and I'm gonna ask you to think about control in the context of your ability to control your privacy practices and your ability to minimize and avoid privacy mishaps. Remember that an organization with a privacy-sensitive corporate culture and governance framework will have fewer privacy mishaps. These are inevitable. They will occur. Everyone experiences breaches, but you should try to focus on minimizing those at the get-go. Being proactive and preventative is cheaper than being reactive and remedial. It's significantly less use of your time, resources, and money. So it's good for business for that reason. Maintaining control over privacy means maintaining control over your reputation, your, your goodwill, and your ability to develop trust. And a lack of control leads to privacy mishaps, which could very well lead to privacy commissioner complaints, inquiries, civil and class action lawsuits, all of which are a significant strain on your resources. So for all of these reasons, privacy is good for business. The next good idea I have is being proactive, not reactive. I've already mentioned that or alluded to it in the previous idea, and you're going to find that a lot of these ideas are intertwined with one another. So the Privacy Commissioner of Ontario refers to something called privacy by design. What she means is don't wait for privacy risks to materialize, and don't focus on offering remedies for when they do. Privacy mishaps do and will occur. What you need to do is focus on minimizing their occurrence. You do this by designing privacy principles and building privacy protections into everyday business practices. So you start with your accountability mechanisms. You need to develop top-down and bottom-up accountability mechanisms. So most have designated a privacy officer. Many will have developed and put together a privacy team, many larger institutions. If you do have the opportunity to develop a privacy team, what you should do is start to build a team or a group of individuals who are involved in every step of the collection, use, disclosure, and retention of personal information within your organization. For example, you might have intake workers, receptionists, data entry staff, program staff, and fundraising staff. These people should be able to give you the most complete analysis of your data collection practices and required data protection practices. Then go down a level from your privacy officer and privacy team and establish oversight and accountability for privacy within each program and service area to help foster a top-down, bottom-up approach. Develop, implement, and maintain a privacy policy and, and personal data information practices. Ask yourselves, what do we collect? Why do we collect it? Make a list. Look at every field on every form that your organization uses in print and online. Don't forget your intake, registration, website donation, or information request forms. Look at everything that you collect and ask yourselves, why do you collect this information and what do you use it for? Where do you keep it and how is it secured? And consider your physical, organizational, and technological measures. 
ask who has access to the information, to whom is it disclosed, and when and how is it disposed of. Once you've gone through this exercise, you should then, then engage in privacy training. This would include education on the privacy principles and the spirit of the law, the how-tos in terms of how it is that you secure information, whether through encryption, password protection, locked offices and filing cabinets and otherwise, and constant re awareness training and retraining. So it's vitally important that each employee in your organization is well-versed on privacy, and making training your mantra is key because it could be your best privacy asset. So I say the problem with privacy is people. People make mistakes and people are curious. So the more people know and understand and are constantly aware of privacy, the better your organization will be able to face the issues of privacy and minimizing risks and maximizing compliance. When you're developing training, develop an enduring program and try to build it into other training programs that you already have in existence. You probably already have effective structures and processes for orienting new individuals to the organization. Just build privacy into it. It doesn't have to be a separate training program. And make sure that when you do train, that the training program is customized to your own organizational needs and nuances and focuses on the individual's position and role within the organization. That will make for the best training, most effective training program. Establish mechanisms to communicate with staff and agents about changes in privacy policies and safeguarding enhancements. And make sure that you listen to your employees and agents and get their feedback because a lot of the times they are the ones who are going to help you identify where you may have some gaps and where you might need to implement some improvements. They're a key resource to this privacy compliance program. Develop a responsive communication process to address questions after the training is completed. And create a reference repository of up-to-date policies and practices. Stick it on your intranet so people can go to it, find your policies and your practices very easily. Finally, make sure that you monitor your performance. Monitoring is what's going to assist you in identifying key gaps, things you may have missed the first time around, and in addressing them before a privacy mishap occurs. Privacy risks are continuously evolving because your programs and services are continuously evolving. So things change, regardless of what you set up years ago, should be revisited from time to time to make sure it addresses the changes that your organization has made. And you should also monitor trends in privacy compliance, looking at other standards, guidelines, and best practices. Networking at a, a facility like this is key. Making sure you find out what others in your community are doing is key. Make sure you keep up what the others are doing. You don't want to be the one who falls behind. So in reference back to the case study of the Ottawa Hospital, protections against a blatant disregard for an individual's privacy by an employee must be built into the policies and practices of an organization in all of these ways. The third key uh, idea is establish goals based on legal compliance and best practices. So the regulatory landscape is complex and continually evolving to address emerging issues. In Canada, we have the Federal Personal Information Protection Act. We have general privacy laws in BC, Alberta, and Quebec. We have health privacy laws in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and Labrador. And we have public sector privacy laws in all of the provinces and all of the territories. So depending on the circumstances, more than one act could apply in any given situation at any given time, or no acts might apply in a given situation. And if no acts apply, then what you should be considering is your stakeholder expectations and ensuring that they prevail. In respect of the Personal Information Protection Electronic Documents Act, it applies if you are collecting, using, or disclosing personal information in the context of commercial activities. 
So commercial activity has been defined very helpfully under the statute as an act or conduct of any regular course of conduct that is of a commercial character. <laughs> Clear as mud, right? So according to the Privacy Commissioner, collecting membership fees, fundraising, compiling a list of members' activities, names and addresses, and mailing newsletters are not commercial activities. So the act would not apply to those activities. According to the courts, a commercial activity is more than a mere exchange of consideration. So for example, if an association collects membership fees in exchange for services and benefits of membership, that is not a commercial activity, according to the courts, as the case law stands now. What you should be aware is case law is evolving, and the courts may very well broaden the scope of what does and doesn't constitute commercial activity. But keep in mind that bartering or leasing membership or donor lists is a commercial activity and is therefore subject to the federal statute. In terms of provincial privacy legislation and nonprofits, three provinces have passed their own general privacy legislation, being Alberta, BC, and Quebec. Quebec and BC's legislation apply to every organization that collects, uses, and discloses personal information, regardless of whether or not it's for a commercial activity. So not-for-profit charitable corporations do have to comply with those statutes. Alberta has an exception for nonprofit organizations, so that statute does not apply to charities and not-for-profits in respect of their non-commercial activities in Alberta. And PIPIDA continues to apply to the cross-border transfer of information. So if you're in one province sending information to another province or out of the country, PIPIDA does apply. And one thing that I've come across is a number of organizations who've set up agents in the U.S. to monitor their servers who have access to the information from the U.S., PIPIDA would apply to that sort of an arrangement, and you need to be mindful of the requirements. So what all of this really means is that you need to have a thorough understanding of what law or laws apply to your organization. Somebody needs to know what laws apply, if any, but they should dig further and figure out what are the regulatory developments under the laws, what is the latest case law? Has the definition of commercial activity been broadened or expanded? What are the pr Privacy Commissioner's findings and are they useful and applicable to our organization? And what are the latest guidelines? And this will help you benchmark and compare to what others are doing. So every organization, regardless of whether the laws apply or don't apply, should try to comply with the spirit of the law and fair information practices because I think all of your stakeholders do expect that. Idea number four, develop breach protocols now, not on the fly. So there are all kinds of privacy breaches out there that you're probably aware of, and they're bordering on the ridiculous to the sublime. There have been privacy breaches where records of personal health information were scattered in the streets of downtown Toronto. What happened was the hospital recycled papers instead of shredded them. Movie company bought them and used them as a prop. So all of this personal information was out there. And I know there are individuals from the organization who spent their morning running around collecting as many pieces of paper as they could find. You would have heard of stories of stolen laptops and USB keys. So the privacy breach occurs when they're not password protected and when the information is not encrypted. My favorite story, which you may or may not have heard yet, has to do with a video image of a patient attending a methadone clinic and being captured by a wireless mobile rear assist parking device in a car parked near the clinic. So in this case, what happened was the individual is parking his car near the clinic, and much to his surprise, as he was parking and using this device, he saw a disturbing image of a woman using a toilet at the clinic. Now the woman was aware that she was under surveillance because she was providing a urine sample and the surveillance is there to ensure that her sample is not tampered with. And she consented to this practice, part of being patient at this clinic. What she didn't consent to was to have this image broadcast outside of the clinic. 
So following a privacy commissioner's investigation and order, what they found was the camera system was using a wireless device, and they had to change that to a wired device so that it wouldn't happen again. So what happens if a privacy mishap occurs at your organization? Are you prepared? Do you know what steps you need to take in order to address a privacy breach? My advice to you is get prepared now before it happens. Map out a strategy and develop your protocol in advance because it's so much better to deal with this strategically than to deal with it in a panic putting out a fire. The strategy obviously will have to be customized to the actual privacy breach, but the general principles are that every strategy should include the following steps. An initial meeting with key staff members to review the known facts. The development of an action plan to address that particular breach. The assignment of responsibilities to carry out the action plan. Breach containment practices when you identify the scope of the breach and take steps to minimize it and to contain it. Think about notification requirements. Some statutes require you to notify the individuals affected. So you have to consider whether or not those requirements apply to you and how it is you'll go about notifying these individuals if you need to. And consider whether you also want to notify the applicable privacy commissioner to get the commissioner involved early in the process and help you manage the breach. Develop strategies to manage damage to your reputation. Establish effective communication practices both within the organization and externally to stakeholders. Manage an investigation of the breach. So the objects of the investigation are ensuring the immediate requirements of containment and notification are addressed, reviewing the circumstances surrounding the breach, and reviewing the adequacy of your policies and practices in, in protecting personal information. Think about developing response protocols. At what point do you want to go further up the chain and actually go to the board of directors and report on what's taking place? Where do you escalate? When don't you escalate? And obviously you have to retrain individuals after the breach, let them know what happened and let them know how to deal with things better so it never happens again. And so finally, from time to time, if you are an unhappy organization that's subject to many privacy mishaps and breaches, analyze trends, figure out what's going on and address them proactively. Don't wait for the next breach. The last good idea is revisit, revise, and retrain. And I think I actually have covered all of these in discussing the first four ideas. What I'm referring to here is monitoring your privacy performance, reviewing lessons learned, and implementing changes, identifying gaps, and retraining employees and agents from time to time. Don't just leave it to the initial orientation. Keep the awareness going to build the privacy culture. So these lessons were learned the hard way by the Ottawa Hospital. My suggestion to you is take these lessons and work on them to make sure that this does not happen to you and that you're not subject to a privacy commissioner's order. Thanks, Lily. Um, maybe I can ask you one question before mm -hmm. we go into our uh, discussion because it was not a definition that you offered right at the beginning. And just so we're all on the same page, um, it, at our table discussions, can you just give us a definition of what is personal information? Because that, that may, that's something that you <coughs> skimmed over at the very beginning, and it may be a basic question that people have going into their uh, table discussions. Okay. Well, depending on the statute, the definition is slightly different from province to province and federally.